So we're a year on from the moment from when the pandemic first started and it still feels like we're operating in quite an unpredictable world. Businesses everywhere are looking to marketers to really take the lead on the return to growth um, and that's really why we wanted to talk to you today. As an experienced marketer we want to hear a little bit more about your experience, how it's impacted your way of working over the last year and just kind of your strategy and how you approach sort of the business environment moving forward. So thank you very much for joining us today Paul. Can we start off with do you want to introduce yourself sort of talk about um, who you are and what you do my name is Paul Stevenson I'm a, a now an independent marketing consultant uh, I uh, work for a, a consultancy called WTWS uh, which is mine um, and uh, I have two main roles within that business I do uh, strategic marketing strategy at a boardroom level and I also uh, support, uh, mentor existing internal marketing teams to help with the delivery of those strategies. And can you tell us a little bit more about your career journey? How did you end up where you are today? Both of my parents had businesses, uh, different businesses, and I think I had the kind of proverbial uh, kitchen table start uh, to my career in terms of listening to all of their uh, let me say issues uh, on a regular basis and, and it made me um, fascinated actually about business in general but in particular marketing um, and probably the influence and the strength and the power of good marketing when it's done well. Um, I suppose the next sort of foundation part of my career uh, in the early 90s I was offered a job uh, with McCann Erickson uh, at the time, uh, the largest single advertising agency in the world. So very, very lucky, uh, but in Moscow. And uh, it, Moscow at the time had a, a reputation similar to that of maybe Afghanistan or something. Um, I think Yeltsin had just ordered that the White House got shot with tanks. And so, you know, there were curfews and it was all kind of crazy. And I was um, young and, you know, I thought it was adventurous and exciting. And I was very, very quickly elevated to um, roles way beyond my station, if I'm really honest. Certainly way beyond my experience levels, just because nobody would go. But um, I was supported very well. I was trained very well, very well. And uh, in that process, I was then given, you know, some very, very big global brands and was very fortunate to be able to work on very, very big global brand campaigns you know, sort of global repositioning work, uh, campaigns over sort of 12, 13 time zones, that kind of thing. At a very young age, you know, so I, I worked very hard. That was good. And then I ran the St. Petersburg office. And then it was the beginning of maybe 15 years of placements abroad that I didn't really expect. But I, uh, you know, I moved around. I went to Germany. I went to America. I went to Australia. Eventually settled back in London. And... I think actually what, what really drove me, if I can remember clearly, was uh, as an agency person, often getting the brief a bit late sometimes. And I think the better I became as a marketer, uh, the more experienced, the more I would start to challenge the briefs and want to understand the rationale behind why I was getting that brief. And, and so that made me want to become an in-house marketer. Uh, so I took various roles um, from brand manager and product manager through to sort of marketing manager, group marketing director, those kind of roles. And first set up um, uh, an agency in London called Wall to Wall Sunshine uh, for various reasons. And, and that did outsourced marketing management. So uh, just pure marketing management, really. And then I relocated back to Exeter, which is where I went to school. So I'm getting there, I promise. <laughs> and uh, that was just over 10 years ago. And now I'm an, you know, an independent marketing consultant working out of Exeter. Wow. So very, de very decorated career. No, that's great. It sounds like that first step of bravery really paid off and gave you that exposure sort of to the global market, clients all over the world. Yeah, it's a very interesting journey. No, I think, I think you're right. And I, and I think I worked hard. That, yeah. You know, especially when you're forging your career, when you, you're starting, uh, it was a brilliant opportunity. And um, all I remember doing every single night was carrying boxes and files home and studying <laughs> all night <laughs> and pretending I hadn't when I got back in the next day. And oh, I've just rustled this up. But actually, <laughs> I only went to bed at three o'clock in the morning. 
Yeah. Oh, great. Okay. Well, in your current position at the moment, talking about you know the pandemic and the reaction that you've sort of seen with the clients that you work with. Has there been an increased reliance, in your opinion, on digital activities and communications? Yes. I mean, I think in the beginning there was no choice. Yeah. Everything kind of fell off a cliff and, you know, online e-commerce became the hero. But but something I, I've, I feel that's happened is it, it's been very much of a kind of an acceleration. So many of the changes I think that have been happening in the last 12 to 18 months I think it's just been things that were going to happen maybe that were going to take five years or eight years um, and, and it depends on the industry and, and the people that you're working with but this transformation this digital transformation piece has been happening for 20 years um, every company is on that journey and then all of a sudden it was right we've all just got to move it all forward really really quick um, and I think there was the, the the kind of technology, you know, the big data trends, the processes, the efficiency, all of that was kind of coming along. I think the biggest shock has been the cultural organisational change. That I didn't quite foresee and I didn't quite see how that was going to change, you know, the kind of human behaviour side. Um, and then kind of conversely, I think on the, on the flip side, what's really, what, what's been interesting for me is how important, you know, people talk about being in the real, but it's it's the live stuff, you know, that actually is, is sort of showing itself as being more impactful and maybe more special than it was before. And and that, that balancing has been very, very interesting to, to the point now where I think even speaking to a human is becoming a real luxury. It, it's, yeah. you know, you can already see that trend panning out that if you don't want to talk to a, you know, an automated bot, you're going to be paying a premium if you want to talk to a human and i and i also think that meetings are becoming more important or we're putting more effort into them but, yeah. but to properly answer your question absolutely digital everywhere um yeah there's a lot going on it's very complicated no i think you're exactly right in what you said there and we've definitely seen a shift at Proctors and you know the demand for digital in our clients and it's something that we've really invested in as a team sort of developing those digital initiatives to offer the solutions that we can um, to sort of replace those face-to-face -face interactions as much as possible over the last year or so. I think you said an interesting point there about the kind of cultural shift within organisations. Do you want to talk about that a bit more about what you mean? Do you mean kind of the impact on the ways that we're working with each other? You know, it's a, it's a really big piece and, and I, I think it's um, people, have, the, the demands on people have been um, accelerated also, I think. And whilst I think the kind of technology, physical processes, those changes have been relatively straightforward to fix. I think now we are much more aware of well-being and you know our, our mental state and, and what motivates and drives people and, and all of those things. Those things are very much harder now to manage. Certainly, when you talk about remotely, um, distance, mm -hmm. and and I, and I think organisations are learning. You know, we we keep talking about that. You know, some organisations are saying, "I want you all back in the office as soon as possible." Some organisations are saying, don't ever have to come back in, you're fine where you are. And then there's this, this huge middle piece that we're all trying to work out what's best. What, you know, I don't think, you know, and I think there is that middle way. And I think that cultural organisation change about how do I, as an organisation, still deliver maximum value and service to my customers? Mm -hmm whilst also making sure that you know my employees are well and, and of course happy employees mean that you invent, invariably deliver a better service anyway yeah no i think you're completely right it's all about finding the middle ground between getting the productivity and sort of the well-being that you need from these face-to-face -face interactions not only with clients but with your colleagues but also now you know the adaption to this flexible way of working that has proven to work working from home, adopting all of these technologies. So yeah, no, I, I completely agree with what you've said there. Do you think that on a professional level, you have found difficulty with the lack of face-to-face -face communication and on a personal level? 
you, you know, it's funny. I think, you know, adaptability, resourcefulness, all of those kind of traits have really been tested. Um, I, I think, I don't know, is it was a, it was a kind of a Plato uh, quote that's obviously evolved over the years, but was it about necessity is the mother of invention? And, and, I, and I feel like everything has to be relearned and there's a new way of delivering and doing just about everything. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but... Yeah. No, it does. I think, I think that's true. It's a nice sentiment that we do adapt to whatever environment we're in. And I think back when it was March 2020, when we first went into lockdown, I think there was a big shift of, you know, maybe a sense of panic. Um, before we kind of got back onto the road of recovery and sort of figuring out the ways to adapt to new working. And then, yeah, as humans, we do adjust to what's happening around us. And now we are in that rhythm. And now almost it's another period of adjustment as we ease out of lockdown and sort of figuring out the best ways to navigate the you know working environment moving forward. No, I, I agree. And it's definitely not been easy. Well, it certainly hasn't been straightforward. I, I think, you know, the, the word pivot comes up a lot, but I always think the word complicated comes up a lot. <laughs> yeah. Everything seems to have another layer or two or three. It's just become complicated. Yeah, definitely. Can you perhaps give us an example um, of a project? If you've got um, sort of NDAs or confidentiality agreements that feel free to not talk about clients directly, but could you maybe talk about a project where you've had to adapt to the sort of new digital landscape or uh, the lack of face-to-face -face communication over the last year? Um, of course, and thank you for referencing the confidentiality because of course that's, that's critical in, in my, my business. Um, but uh, there, are, there are so many. Uh, I think maybe, uh, if I think about B2B, you know, I, the holy grail of B2B um, business was at one point having the face-to-face -face meeting. That, that seemed to be, you know, like a key pivotal, pivotal moment where business needed to be done, you know, and whether it's about sharing prototypes, whether about it's, you know, taking briefs, whether it's about closing the deal, all of that just disappeared. And that's been really interesting now where I'm working with clients and we're closing, you know, multi, multi million pound deals where people have never met each other. Yeah. Not once. Um, nearly unheard of, you know, years ago. And, and actually I've been reading lots of white papers and studying about how do you make that process really good um, and as streamlined as possible and as rich and as deep as possible as you could possibly do it before where you might go out for dinner or you might you know build the relationship as you build this sort of uh, professional relationship as a sort of personal professional and and then you see um examples in the sort of b2c arena uh, 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 work with a, a state agent group and and of course the estate agent world has already adopted you know um, the kind of right move zoopla search type ways of finding a new property for example and, and uh, advertising one but the the model of actually getting a new house is, is quite traditional quite established you know you, you turn up you get you can no longer show people around you yeah. can't do this you can't do, and I, you know i've seen teams having to learn how to rapidly do video editing and taking photographs from customers um, and video tours and and drones and Google Maps and all of that. and then also making sure the customer feels like they're getting good service because you you know you can no longer turn up if that makes sense and, and do the job yeah just layers and layers of complexity that um, have just been really interesting and challenging. We found the same with a few of our clients as well, replicating that face-to-face -face interaction. We have a lot of clients in the education sector and it's things like virtual open days, sort of giving you know prospect students that experience without being there in person, or you know some of our clients that do virtual uh, trade rooms and showrooms. Yeah, it's been a lot of technology that you know both parties have been getting accustomed to and yeah, that becoming commonplace. Um, which leads me on to my next question. Can you talk about any technologies specifically that you've used that you found particularly helpful over the last year? Okay, that, that, so I can talk about that personally, I suppose, my own personal experience as a marketing yeah. consultant. 
likewise, I've, I've struggled in some respects actually because my my piece is about delivering change. Nobody hires me and says, "Can you keep things exactly as they are, please?" It's always about change management ultimately, and I I go in and you know I see things and I work with the teams and I and I get to understand the business. It's a very much a high touch service. It, it's not a you know I I don't I can sell you furniture and not see you for three years. I've got to be in regularly, and so I invested in. I mean, I, I, I was very aware of not trying to do the buy lots of shiny things that will fix everything. Yeah. But I did invest in a lot of hardware, um, lots of software, uh, huge amounts of. I mean, in fact, I, I sometimes giggle at the moment about my um, my Google Chrome bookmarks. I've got so many different platforms <laughs> and softwares, and of course, I've got you know multiple clients, and all of those clients have. Um, you know, uh, supply chains and partners with their own platforms. And that's been really, really interesting. And I've also been kind of aware of the whole Zoom fatigue, mm. because actually we're not out and about as much, or I'm certainly not. Um, and But actually, I've also gone down, again, and there's a little bit of a theme, but it's not just the digital, although digital is massive and huge, and of course that's where we're relying. And, and I've, um, I have a, a, a massive magnetic glass whiteboard that has been the, my saviour really. I've, ha I've, I've got a stand-up desk that has been okay. really, really good. Yeah. You, would you recommend the stand-up desk for other marketers that are watching this? I, do you know, I, I, I read about it and I did my kind of YouTube study uh, research. It's not for everyone, but it's been brilliant for me and I think it's kept me alert actually at yeah. times. Um, but the, the greatest, uh, while I was sharing investment, is I bought a treadmill, a, a walking treadmill. So I'm standing on it now. It's not on, obviously. <laughs> um, but I, I have clocked up some days 15 miles. Wow. As I've been, and it's been, A, I don't feel guilty at the end of a day for actually not doing anything or doing wow. any exercise. But it's been really beneficial for that whole mental physical well-being piece yeah to keep me kind of alert and and energized i suppose and that and sounds and great along with all the balancing of all the different software i have to deal with yeah i mean i think that's something that we've all struggled with over lockdown getting enough steps in um keep yeah. moving you know a lot of us are just working from home and not having the option to kind of nip into the office or get outside too much so i think yeah that's a great bit of kit that you've invested in there um, and being too and being too close to the fridge, that's not happening. I know. I know those are some of my most regular steps to and from there. <laughs> so talking about sort of mental health and well-being, are there any other ways that you've kind of adopted to keep morale high with you and with your sort of wider team in general? I'm a naturally positive individual. Um, I'm very lucky. I'm one of those really annoying people that wakes up in the morning in a good mood. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's just still getting away. <laughs> oh, leave me alone. Um, but I have noticed there's a, there is a kind of relentless monotony, I think, sometimes about how difficult it is. And, and particularly if you watch the news too often, you know, it, it can be difficult. And I'm very, very aware of that. Um, I, I think as an antidote, I've kind of tried to be uh, as positive as I possibly can. Um, and, you know, simply, you know, being kind, you know, every opportunity you possibly can to be kind and doing those random acts of kindness, uh, showing gratitude, you know, being really grateful for things that do happen that are positive and particularly from colleagues and other individuals and things, um, you know, and, and, and lots of recognition. I think staying focused, which is, you know, it, it's sort of a, something a strategist is usually quite good at anyway, but on the positives and the opportunities, you know, making sure that stays in focus, keep reminding everybody about it and and not wallowing in all the bad stuff. Um, you know, it, it, the, the, the bad is a little bit about, somebody once said to me, it's no good moaning about gravity. It just is what it is. It is there and we all have to put out with it. And I did feel a little bit about the COVID and it was, you know, it's very serious. But yeah. 
I couldn't change it and I couldn't put it right. I, you know, I had to behave and was responsible and all those things. And then I think probably the biggest thing would be humour. And I, and I, having travelled abroad quite a lot and lived abroad quite a lot, I think that's a very British trait. Is you know, it's that kind of Churchill saying of you know if you're going through hell, keep going. <laughs> There's lots of layers of humour within that statement, and I think yeah. humour has really helped keep morale high. I think you've touched on a few nice points there about celebrating the good and sort of keeping the humour right within the team. It's definitely something that we've tried to implement a bit more in Proctors. We produced a lot of content throughout lockdown that was for internal purposes only, you know, that will never see the light of day, but just kept everyone smiling. Um, our MD Roger has also introduced like a weekly good news email. So that celebrates anything positive that's gone on through our team, whether that's new business or any client work or marketing, whatever it is, it kind of lets everyone in the company know what's been going on and just give each other a pat on the back. So yeah, we can definitely relate to that here. And I think that's a nice sentiment that you're putting out there. You do seem like a very positive person and that's nice to see. Thank you, I am. And I love that. I think what you've highlighted that perhaps I would have liked to have brought up because it's a really good point is there was no limit to communication. You had to keep communicating with people, you know, as much as you can. And it's lovely to hear that your organisation has been doing that because I think it makes a massive difference. Yeah, it really does. It also just, for a lot of people that might be living alone and not going out too much, you know, your work colleagues do become a big source of social interaction. So we've also had a quarantine quiz going on, which has been fun and just, you know, taking all of our usual socials that we would do in person, sort of bringing them to that digital environment. So yeah, I think that is really important. Um, okay, so let's talk idea generation. You've mentioned you've got your whiteboard, um, you're keeping morale high in your team. Have you implemented any new strategies, sort of personally or within your working environment for to help with idea generation while we are kind of in this middle phase of still being quite locked in? Having an agency background, actually, that, that's, that's a topic quite close <laughs> to my heart as well, actually. Um, I've probably got a couple of rules, actually. I think for great ideas, um, I'm, a, I'm a great, I'm a big advocate of uh, constantly thinking of new ideas. The, I always think the concept of saying, oh, let's come up with a new idea is, you know, you kind of walk into a room and say, right, let's all think of something we've never ever thought of ever before, <laughs> go. And I think that's very difficult if you don't do it regularly. So I think making sure you've got the right working environment that encourages uh, idea generation on a regular basis means that ideas it's like being match fit is you know you it's like you can't say to everybody right let's go and run a marathon it, it's not that the way it works it's actually if you're running if you know you every now and then you're going to need to run a marathon you better be doing some walking and running on a regular basis i think ideas generation is like that is constantly thinking and making sure that you as an organization come up with new ideas. Yeah, I think that's a, a great metaphor that you've just said there about kind of keeping your fit and your idea, idea fitness high rather than, you know, jumping into a marathon straight away. I think, yeah, having that environment of productivity and innovation is so important, especially in the current environment that we're in now. And I'm sure in, you know, what you do, which is all about change management, and strategy it's something that you have to be you know consistently on the ball rather than you know think of an idea end a project have a break for a while i'm sure yeah it's very fast paced and funny enough it leads into my other rule having an agency background is i think use agencies wisely it's a point that you'll probably like <laughs> yeah you can keep talking about that one but, you know that that's yeah i've seen massive you know very very big global companies try to have their own in-house agencies and in every scenario, I think I can remember, they all didn't work. And, and I think there is definitely a place for in-house agency, you know, um, work, you know, design, all of that. But when you want really fresh and really unusual ideas, you know, you go to an organisation where, you know, their core competence is coming up with ideas all day long, every day. And I think there's a, you know, so the right environment internally that encourages good thinking and I think using agencies wisely is another good way of doing it. 
Yeah, I think definitely having a different set of eyes looking in from the outside can see a completely different perspective. And as you said, obviously we believe very strongly that agencies, you know, are of the utmost importance for, you know, idea generation and creativity. So yeah, I love that you said that one. Um, okay, let's talk a bit about what you've got coming up. Again, we understand that you have to be confidential and sensitive in what you talk about, but do you have any exciting projects that you could talk to us a little bit about? I find nearly everything exciting, which um, might sound a bit ridiculous, but I have a, a rule for myself is that the day I don't find marketing exciting is the day I'm going to quit and go off and do something else. Um, and, and of course, in terms of confidentiality, I can't get into the really good details, uh, not only for the confidentiality, but of course, there will be some competitive advantage pieces in there. But but I'm I, most of my clients actually have, have done some sort of pivoting in the last 12 months. We're all trying new things, you know, regularly. Um, but I've got one project where uh, a client is disrupting uh, a relatively outdated market or certainly a segment of a market. I'm, I'm very excited about that. Uh, I can see the opportunities that excites me. I've, I've got a beautiful repositioning piece where, and this is an unusual scenario, but you know, often marketers will, will sometimes paint a better picture than perhaps the reality or certainly the ambition they will paint. Uh, in this particular example, the company is about five times better than our external image. And it would be so nice to bring those into alignment. And I'm very excited about the nuances about that. And, and a few market entry strategies for some new market segments and some new audiences into new countries and multiple countries. Um, uh, yeah, so, but actually the, the thing that I'm probably the most excited about right now is about team development for the marketing teams I work with. I'm working with some really smart, really lovely people. And I, it might be an age thing in terms of what my career development, but I love the fact that these people are progressing and particularly having gone through COVID, which although it's stretched everybody and we've all had to work again, a bit harder still, it's lovely to see them all becoming really, really competent, very strong marketers. Yeah. So I'm, I'm getting excited about, and that, that in course in turn makes the organisation stronger because the stronger the marketing team, the better the organisation. Yeah, that's a lovely sentiment you said there. Um, so for marketers that are watching this, do you have any tips for them when approaching the next year or so about, you know, whether that's personal or how they should be approaching their strategies? Do you have any top tips that you can share with us? I truly believe it's a brilliant time to be a marketer. Uh, I think it's actually, in fact, I know it's the most complicated, most competitive, most fragmented and difficult time that's ever been within marketing, which in turn makes it much more interesting, much more challenging and probably much more needed than it's ever been. The world is so competitive now that if you don't get your marketing right, you know, not not you know, not that many years ago, it used to be if your product was good, word of mouth would be good and you would sell it. The reality now is that the market leader is the one with the best marketing. Pretty much. Absolutely. You know, conversation, conversation for another day, but actually it's a great time to be a marketer. Um, one thing I would advise if you know telling my younger self perhaps many, many years ago, is that I think it's okay to specialize because you, we've seen in the last, certainly in the last 10, 15 years, marketing specialized quite significantly, you know, from sort of, you'll have data people and digital people and comms people and content people and lots and lots of specializations. But what is happening is, and this is really a little bit of an issue about the fact that marketers aren't getting on the board board as often as you know some other um, departments would be is sure. I think they need to specialize but they need to also study a bit more widely make sure that their broader business context is strong and make sure their wider marketing context is strong and and have that understanding and responsibility of marketing driving revenue and not being an admin piece absolutely I think that'll be helpful advice for all the marketers watching I think 
yeah, that's some strong recommendations you're giving there. Get that breadth of knowledge before thinking about specialising. Um, and then on the flip side of it, talking, I mean, we've addressed what advice you'd give to marketers, but do you have any advice for businesses? I know you've touched on saying invest in your marketing, but is there anything else that you'd like to leave us with today? Do you know, there is, there's, a, there's a kind of leadership piece where I think, um, you know, the, the people at the top of businesses, I think, need to allocate time for leadership. We, we talk about what makes a good leader and uh, what people do. And actually, they, I don't know two leaders that are the same. Um, you know, we've, they've all got different traits and different strengths and different weaknesses. But I think finding that time, and we talk about that working on the business, not in the business, but it's so, so important to allocate the time for really good clarity of thinking and time out to make sure that, you know, that they're very clear on where they're going. They, they know how they're going to win, you know, and they're, they're confident about it and they've done all the research and interrogation. So I think that piece that I've learned and, and maybe COVID in some respects has given people time, you know, to, to relook and refresh. And I've, I've seen the benefit of it. And I think it, it, you can get too easily caught up in the doing and, and you definitely need to have some time to make sure you know you're going in the right direction. Yeah, a hundred percent. Well, Paul, it's been lovely to have you on today. Thank you so much for your time. And if anyone watching would like to get in touch with you, how can they do so? Probably uh, emails as easy as anything. Uh, paul at wtws.co.uk. Thank you. Lovely stuff. All right. Thanks, Paul. Thank you very, very much. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.